Speaking about the dark side, so Christoph, you are at the floor. <laughs> we uh, uh, talk about Jung and the magical revival, the model in conscious and analytical psychology and Venetian esotericism in the early 20th century. Please. All right. So I don't see the slides here, so I will be looking partially on you and partially on slides. This is my um basic uh point to have presentation all right should i how should i make it full screen no it was already full screen. it's it's not yeah you need to there's a little symbol down below Ah, it should be a little symbol down below. Ah, yeah. Or I would be grateful if I could see the same screen here. It would be easier for me to navigate through this, but it's okay. I can do this. I can do it this way. But yeah, probably. I just have an idea. It might work. It might not. It looks like. Oh yeah, <laughs> a bit better. All right. So. I'm very pleased to see you here. There are so many of you. And um, all right, so taking the chance if I'm not doing it online. How many of you know the guy on the right? Do you know who the guy is? I'm just really concerned if I'm talking about some rather, um, well, obvious things or is this, is this some is new right? topic for you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is Alistair Crowley. So I'm going to talk about two pipe smokers and apart from, well, the fact that they love smoking the pipes, they were born in the same uh, year. So um, is it okay to speak without the microphone? I think it's, no, you don't hear me. All right, okay, so I'll go with the microphone. So, my name is Krzysztof Czapkowski. I'm a PhD student from uh, University of Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński in uh, Warsaw. Today I'm going to talk about the esoteric side of Jung and particularly I just want to show you how the concept of the unconscious looked like in three theories. And first of all, well, this is the uh, artwork of Austin Osman Spare, and there are two basic aims of the speeches. Well, for me, uh, this is a uh, first and most important thing to linking to seemingly distant disciplines, so psychology and esotericism, and just I just want to show you how did they interact in the beginning of the 20th century. And well, I can suggest some common ground. This is some philosophy towards the psychology of higher self, so it will just make makes a little bit more sense for you in just next 20 minutes. And the plan for today is I will start with the idea of the unconscious and I will go through Jung's analytical psychology, just, uh, just some basic facts and then I will move the magical revival in Great Britain and just two currents I chose to show the similarities. And um, Let's start with the problem of the unconscious. Well, this is the basic thing uh, one should ask. How can we just talk about something which is not unconscious? And of course, during the Freud, there are some levels of uh, things happening. On the conscious level, we are gathered here. I am just talking to you, presenting some images of a madman. But on the other part, we just can see that um, there is something on the higher ground of this. So the unconscious works like there's some inner realm in the psyche. So I can say that we are just imagining the unimaginable. So this way, everything we can say about our verbal code is just a fault. It's not uh, what the unconscious is. And this is the basic point. And well, reaching back to the zeitgeist, of course, in the twist of the 19th and the 20th century, there was a big fear of madness, but the unconscious was, well, expected to be explored in the future researches. Sadly, it was not. In the 1950s, uh, cognitive behavioral uh, therapy took the stage and just, uh, I would say, um, this is not, um, uh, unconscious is not really 
the main thing for the study of psychology like many suggest uh, like many suggested before and of course i'm going to talk about some theories which are well we can find a ground in which they are uh psychological <laughs> According to Dobroczyński, we have five factors of uh, psychological theory. We have idea of substantial soul, topography, inner relation. Um, it's also a private personal experience and it consists of, of undiscovered parts. And in this way, well, we can see that psychoanalysis is something on the twist of romanticism and modernism during to Gergen. I, I really like uh, Gergen's style of thinking because psychoanalysis is placed, in fact, on the twist of the two mindsets, the romanticism being about spirituality, being about something different like this hidden realm. And modernism is about the science, it's about cause and effect. And as we can see, it's not really about the cause and effect. And uh, there were two models of deaf psychology. Um, I talked about this a year ago about the Neoplatonism. Well, there are two ways we can go. And we can choose today the Neoplatonic path of the ontology of psyche. <laughs> so let's start with Jung's analytical psychology, of course, some basic things. Uh, well, Jung was a grandson of a Freemason, son of a pastor, and of course he became world famous psychiatrist who allowed Freud to go to US just uh, to explore psychoanalysis on the new continent. And in fact, he was an ex heir of Freud's psychoanalysis, and his analytical psychology is now considered as the most occult for the amount of psychologists and in fact well Freud would absolutely see it this way and so uh, there is a big myth about you being a spiritual guru leader of nationalistic cult according to Noel for example it was before the red book was published probably uh, Noel would not put it this way uh, uh, for now he was the sage bowling and alchemist theorist but well we just cannot uh, grasp the fact of the, who Jung was, but in fact we can see him as a part of magical revival. Well, um, he spent his childhood in, a, I would say, pagan countryside uh, of uh, Switzerland, and his research is uh, concentrated, in, uh, concentrated about spiritism, mediumism, and cryptomnesia. And of course, it all had uh, some effect on uh, his spirituality. There's um, a very famous book called uh, Seven Sermons to the Dead, so when Jung literally talked with the dead who haunted his house after uh, his breakup with Freud. So his system is a fruit of, would say, magical withdrawal. The analytical psychology took place, uh, took its form during his uh, time of a mental crisis and um, he went up like a Christ from the desert with his new thought, new evangelion for psychoanalysis. And his initiator was Philemon, his place on the right side. Uh, this is also an image drawn by Jung. This is a figure of his inner teacher with whom he contacted during uh, his uh, years of withdrawal. And of course, the unconscious, we can split uh, into ideas, collective unconscious, which is ontolo ontologically primordial dimension of psyche. In 1925, Jung even said that individuals are coming out of a certain common level. So the collective unconscious is the primal psyche. And then we have individual unconscious, which is structural. We can see, or can, I would put it in Hillmanian way, imagine some structures like shadow, persona, um, we can see the final point because unconscious is pushing us towards discovering our own self. And this way uh, thinking, it's also, um, it's also full of forces and some entities like complexes. These are also the part of the soul of the world. It's not uh, causally connected, but of course Jung puts this this way that uh, we are coexisting as a part of a big psyche. And of course he based his model on uh, Neoplatonic topography. In fact, this is the only uh, passage uh, of Jung uh, saying straightforward that his uh, 
um, psychology is based on Neoplatonism. And of course, um, it has some effect on the self being the center point of the psyche, which also um, structuralize our life. It chooses, I would also go Hillmanian way, the body. So when it comes uh, to some wider context, I used the magical revival after Kenneth Grant. He was a principal of uh, Crowley. He set his own magical order called, and it's all functioning now in the UK, it's called Typhonian order. And um, well, going back to the time when, uh, to the times I'm talking about, for example, in 1916, Jung published the first English volume called The Psychology of the Unconscious. This is the supplementary volume B, if you want to have uh, the original translation. And so I would say it was a time for a struggle between Jung and Freud, because it was Jung who was the first one to publish English version of Psychology of the Unconscious. And also it has some significance for the magical revival, as I will show later. But the unconscious was in fact already in the center and it was Jung who provided the work from the field of psychology to fill it. And uh, well, the mythos of this undiscovered part of the self also touched the uh, thinking of the occultists. And all the occult knowledge is in fact sort of an elaborate work with the unconscious. It's theurgy, projective methods, Eastern practices. And uh, this is a mixture of Western and Eastern thought. And uh, of course, there are many spiritual leaders taking some uh, path on the guided mysticism. But in fact, it's all about dealing with the unconscious. And there are lots of means like Kabbalah, this is the uh, tree of life, Kabbalistic tree of life, um, painted by Steffi Grant, wife of Kenneth. Also, they use astrology, tarot, mythology, ritual, magic, other states of mind using some uh, substances like marijuana or uh, absinthe. So when it comes to occult lineages, th this goes some tricky part of it. On the right side, you can see Aleister Crowley during uh, so, so called Rites of Eleusis. Yeah, in the 1960s, you could just bought a ticket for this kind of spectacle. It was a, quite a fascinating time. Well, uh, secret societies were formed during this way. And I would say all of them were somehow how connected with the secret chiefs or just hidden masters. So all the occult societies were meant to reveal some universal tradition, universal lineages. And the leaders of the occult orders claimed that they have some contacts with something bigger, something unconscious. And the first one, well, historically speaking, was uh, the Theosophical Society uh, set by Helena Petronova Blavatsky from born in the Ukraine. It was set uh, in the uh, US, but in fact, it was the first one using the Orientalism, uh, Egyptian symbolism as a a first big culture for the Europeans as it should be during the Blavatsky and spiritism, mediumism, and of course, some Neoplatonic emanationism, which comes from the um, Hermeticism. And in fact, uh, the path of returning to absolute is uh, somehow the leading theme for the occultists. The next one, and now we focus on the UK-based uh, lineages, is the Hermetic Order or the Order of the Golden Dawn. And they use uh, ceremonial magics based on the Rosicrucian and some Hermetic mm -hmm. tradition. And the part of, uh, uh, of Golden Dawn was Alistair Crowley. And after he reached the seventh degree, he was uh, refused to go further, sixth, sorry. Uh, and that's how he formed his uh, order of AA. This is called the Order of a Silver Star again to Astrum, but in fact, Crowley did not ever say what AA stands for. It's uh, the only place he said is the Great White Brotherhood. And in fact, it was the vehicle to promote his telema. And this is the system I'm going to elaborate a little bit and then I will move to witchcraft way of thinking from Austin Osman Spurs. So when it comes to 
Edward Alistair Crowley, because this is his uh, name. He was a child of a rich family of Plymouth Brethren. It, it was a Christian cult, so that's why uh, he developed his, uh, how he developed his, I would say, religious drive. Well, he left Cambridge with no degree. She was, he was studying English literature. In fact, he inherited lots of money, and he just felt that he didn't need to take any final exams. So um, there is a lots of myth about Alistair Crowley and him being better than the, his tutors. We don't know uh, how it was because, well, I would say his narcissistic confessions uh, tells uh, more about his fantasy about himself. But in fact, he was a poet, alpinist, chess master, novelist, philosopher, traveler, ceremonial magicians, but most of all, he was the great apocalyptic beast, as he called himself. But well, Ah, when it comes to Crowley, his initiator was uh, Iwas. It was some, uh, as with Kenneth Grant put it, extraterrestrial intelligence. But even Crowley called him as a part of his psyche. Well, Iwas di di dictated to him uh, Liber Alve Legis, which is called the Book of the Law, which is the central text in Telema. And uh, Telema means will in Greek. And do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law is his uh, motto of, uh, of his new religion. And it must uh, be understood as will being some inner version of a self reflecting some cosmic hierarchy. And it also had some impact on the unconscious. But uh, Crowley set himself as a prophet of the new Ian. And this is like the Ionic versions of Crowley is uh, somehow like Bachofen suggested. First one uh, belongs to femininity, to the mother. The next one is a phallic cult. And the uh, third one, which Crowley saw himself uh, leader of, is uh, connected with a rising child, new consciousness. I would say hippies would put the age of Aquarius in this place. So the basic, uh, the basic aim of Telema is getting a conversation of Holy Guardian Angel, which is in fact some spiritual being in sight. This is uh, Crowley's portrait. So if you want to, see, if you want to know how does he see himself, well. In fact, um, there is no evidence that Jung wrote anything about Crowley, but Crowley wrote about Jung. In 1916, he published in the newspaper a short text about Jung's psychoanalysis. I don't really think he nailed it because he rather misunderstood uh, uh, Jung's uh, thoughts on the unconscious, but there is one great thing. I would say uh, that he understood the psyche, well, how to put it, he understood libido Freudian way, but he put it in the central point as Jung does it. So, in fact, he did a mixture of two uh, psychologists placing sexuality in the center. So for him, man is a microcosm. This is image, concentrated point of consciousness, and it reflects the macrocosm. So this is the basics of the esoteric thought, as above, so below. And he used, uh, through his uh, writings, the Kabbalistic map of soul. And the first triad, Yehi, the Haya, and the Shama, is, is a triad which is not separable. And in fact, Yehida is a keter of uh, the, the Tree of Light, spark of a Godhead. Uh, Haya is, uh, is uh, sort of a will, as understood by Crowley and the Shama. Uh, is just uh, the intelligence or just all the knowledge, which is also part of the collective unconscious for Jung. When it comes to Ruach and Nefesh, uh, Ruach is uh, connected with the intellect and Nefesh, I would say, with Freudian Id. So, um, of course, Crowley wrote about dreams, and for him, dreams were just reflection of, of the this, this self, or just, I would put it his way, will. 
This is another portrait of Crowley. So mm, there's something about being narcissistic, of course, as you can see. But um, he's he equal he for him unconscious is equal with libido, and uh, in the same time libido is taking the main place in his system as a whole pansexual theory driving making sexuality the holiest point of human soul and also acting the way of the unconscious but he is the one who would rather listen to the uh, sexual drive and unconscious at the same time is a pay is a guide towards self-fulfillment and for example this is a quote from Eliber Aleph I think one of his best texts the unconscious has become uh, so used to doing his true will that there is no need to interference so in fact for him we know the basic uh, uh, nature of our psyche so According to him, the psyche is structured, impenetrable, but it reflects the soul of the world. And for the most, it's based on sexuality. Austin Osman Spare, I would say, is a current world famous witch and a painter. In fact, um, he was the one, uh, his painting was exposed on the Royal Academy when he was 19. He is the youngest one, the youngest uh, painter who had this privilege. But in fact, uh, he skipped his education at the age of 13. So he has no uh, academic uh, influences, but um, he was some, uh, sometime rejected also by Crowley's order. He called him a black brother, a black magician. But in fact, he is the father of so-called Zuskia Kultus. Uh, and uh, in fact, he is the father of contemporary witchcraft. It was uh, long before the Wicca was uh, um, uh, developed by Gardner. His initiator was Mrs. Patterson, and there is no historical uh, evidence that Miss Patterson really existed. He was, she was just a product of his imagination, probably, but there is a mythos behind his figure that he was uh, taught by a witch how to become a true witch master. And of course, his psychology, his psyche is balanced of Zos being of human body and its drive, I would say this it in uh, Freudian theory and Kia, which is universal mind, uh, skipping uh, directly through the collective unconscious. The main work, of course, the title is so full, so filled with psychological, uh, psychological ideas. But I would say it reflects the needs of the psychology of the unconscious, which is aimed to be pu uh, published in the next three years by Jung. But what is really interesting about this one? is uh, his theory of unconscious, so-called psychology of believing in sigils. Well, this picture is really small, but I just, uh, if, I, if you want me to show how those sigils function, well, of the letters, he was making the symbols. And in this moment, when the symbol is made, you just need to forget what was uh, was the symbol stands for we just need to um, meditate on the symbol and our unconscious needs to fulfill the will of the symbol so uh, the subconsciousness because this is how the unconscious was uh, called by him um, is uh, like he said epitome of all experience and wisdom past incarnations men's animals so, so this is sort of a neoplatonic collective unconscious but as we said well for someone who uh, skipped his education at the age of 13 well um he talked about the magical obsession, which is called uh, some subconscious activity. He, uh, for him, it was equal with, with the genius or in the same time with insanity. So this is uh, quite against the zeitgeist, uh, the fear of the insanity. In fact, this is a cult of the unconscious psyche. And uh, this is a really peculiar thing of the Book of Pleasure. Well, according to him, a bat, when it comes to uh, some um, 
uh, theory. Uh, for example, this is the evolutionist thing that unconscious is uh, equated with um, the evolution. So this is the will to grow, to, to desire to fly, made bats fly. And also the symbol uh, which is rooted in the psyche might uh, force us to um, uh, act according to our will. So, a uh, short summary. The, f uh, the main similarity is uh, some existence of the secret chiefs, some philosophical prototype which is Neoplatonism, and some finalist perspective which uh, makes us think that our psyche is creating us. The difference, of course, is role of sexuality, which was not so on the main, uh, which was not so main thing for Jung, and of course, uses of psychological terms, which was in many ways um, put straightforward by Jung, but for, by the occultists, they were using it freely. And when it comes to the conclusion, my last sentence, the beginning, the beginning of the 20th century introduced various attempts to conceptualize hidden powers of the mind, even before Freud and Jung did. And it was some, I would say, uh, absolutely different way. And uh, of course, we can talk about some extraterrestrial intelligences, but also we can thought it the Jungian way as a part of the collective psyche. So here are my references. Uh, if you want, you can take the photo and I'm just open for all of the questions. Thank you very much and sorry for prolonging it a little bit. I, I have some little reservations about your interpretations of Jung, since uh, if you call Jung an exotericist, you should also call Freud an exotericist, since Freud was related to the Bnaibrit, and Freud uh, spoke about the dreams and the occult. So you, you, you would arrive at the conclusion that Freud also is an exotericist, and I would be a little uh, perplexed about it. Uh, when you speak about the fact that uh, Jung uh, uh, wrote about uh, the occult phenomena, you have to remember that uh, he wrote about psychology and pathology of the occult phenomena because he wanted to yes, study yes. The, the occult phenomena and then he discovered that there were no occult phenomena and when, when, when studied cryptomnesia is not an occult phenomena. But I, I, I would uh, speak for very long about this, but ju mm -hmm. just to say, I, I'm, I'm not sharing everything of your interpretation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, also a common part con uh, connected to, to, to your words that uh, obviously this is such a rich and fascinating field and the, and the possible interactions here yeah. are, are great. But it's very easy to somehow, yeah, to, to, to find ourselves lost in, in, in among the, the similarities and the analogies. Uh -huh. So maybe one uh, possible solution could be to, to find the historical links and, uh -huh. and do a pure historical research trying to identify the, the exact influences upon uh -huh. these figures. For example, you mentioned sigil magic, which is a wonderful, very interesting field, really. And I can understand it as a kind of a, an inverse psychoanalysis, a, a Freudian one, and, and, a nice. and, and not a yeah. Jungian. So yeah. the, 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 I think the, the finding the, the exact historical links would illuminate these questions from a di different angle, maybe. I'm not sure if that's the idea. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, um, both uh, Crowley and Spur had some backgrounds when it comes to they both tried to, tried to cite some current scientists, philosophers, and of course they were all uh, fascinated by Nietzsche, by Schopenhauer, 
And these are the philosophies which are, uh, in fact, on the background of their theories. And I would say that, of course, this is about some links. And I just um, putting the theories as a filling the gap of the lack of the psychology of the unconscious, because it was not yet published. And I would say that uh, text available in German or some more basic English texts were used in some folklore way. I would say that uh, this is the attempt of making psychoanalysis more esoteric or just a branch, how it would go if not the psychologist. This is somehow the image of psychology, how the occult orders or just some occult personalities would imagine psychoanalysis to be, which was not really available back then. And uh, when it comes to resources, uh, there is no direct uh, inspiration. Well, there is no letters proving that uh, Jung actually read Crowley. And, but uh, there are some proofs that some of the theories of uh, Crowley was inspired by Jung. And uh, another fact is that he was using uh, some psychological terms without giving a proper definition. So this is in fact how the occult orders look like, giving some names without giving a definition, adding it rather more experience point in the form of initiation, in the form of magic. So this is rather encouraging to, to take this, as you just brilliantly put it, reverse psychoanalysis, right? Yes, I, there's no reference whatsoever in, to Crowley in Jung's works, neither in his library. The only Crowley Jung has is Alice Crowley, the novelist. So. Uh -huh. From that point of view, it's zero. Um, but one question I had was, um, do you, I'm not sure that I get why you need Jung in, in your research, because uh, I don't know, like, um, what is your um, general uh, purpose of research? I can get a little bit more, because I think it's, I understand the whole British mm. esoteric, but yeah. Jung, yes, he's Neoplatonist, but he's also a lot more. And every time he tried to straight jack Jung into a single of these hmm. uh, various categories, you precisely miss Jung. Hmm. He wanted to be recognized as a, as a Jainian psychologist, which is obviously a little, a little more than he was. But oh. he, so Jung's works, it's filled with critiques of theosophists, of Blavatsky, you know. Yeah, he talks even against uh, joining some occult orders because, well, f for main part of the work of Jung was working towards self, mm -hmm. and it's not influenced by any of the spiritual guru. This is the first thing. But, well, when it comes to this Neoplatonic solutions, well, when it comes to theurgy, like uh, the moment when Philemon appears, some of the psychic figures appears in the Red Book, this is the moment when uh, I would say uh, there are, uh, I don't know, have you heard about McLennan who wrote uh, some parts about theurgy, Neoplatonism and Jung. This is a really good read just to look on this uh, Red Book and Red Book action, Red Book uh, imagery a different way. And I would point out that uh, for Freud, uh, the unconscious is mainly, apart from some basic instincts, something which is created during the life with some, I would say, parts belonging to this id sphere. And uh, what is common for them is that, um, well, those theories were rather not really connected, but was really fascinated. They all went the Neoplatonic way. And this is the way the, the uh, psychology refuses to go. And well, 
This is my opinion, but why Jung is forgotten on the academic ground is because uh, he went rather more Neoplatonic way. Of course, there are some controversial stuff about the alchemy, the interpretations, but when it comes to model of uh, psychology, this is go to the Aristotelian way. No pre-existence of soul, right? Uh, the soul does not exist before we are born. For Jung, this is quite a different way. Of course, we can take Hillman and making it even more postmodern way, and just maybe even putting it up to some absurd point, non academic point, psychohistory point, and just adjusting things to the thesis. But on the other hand, we can see, um, apart from this central European German uh, psychology, some of the um, I would say under research themes. And of course, taking Spur as a 15, uh, 13 year old, abandoning, uh, you abandoning an education, the writing about the unconsciousness of bats. This is hilarious, right? But on the other hand, we can see Crowley, we can see uh, many of his writing, well, going back to Kabbalah going back uh, to this uh, fivefold division of soul. And th these are the things which are somehow present in a Jungian work, some in the references. For example, well, when, when you ask me, Jung goes more esoteric way on the seminars, like Zarathustra seminar. Well, he is not writing to the academics. He's just speaking to his students and elephants. And this is the way the Jung, Jung goes really esoteric. And this is the way we can also link it to some occult. So I don't understand that. No. no. I think it's mm -hmm. really, uh, it's really not out of place. Really, the, the Zarathustra seminar is not an esotericist book. But this is one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, but I just didn't understand. Sorry, I mean, it yeah. feels like a bit confusing. What I'm um, saying earlier, I think. Jung had an interest in Neoplatonism, yes. Um, mm -hmm. re reading Jung's ecology in the Neoplatonic lens is arbitrary. It's one of the multiple ways in which this has been done in the past, and one of the reasons why Jung is being labeled in all possible ways. Mm -hmm. But he calls in some, in himself a son of, you know, Jamesian pragmatism of Pierre Jeunet and Theodore mm -hmm. Fournoy. I mean, that's hmm. barely nothing to do with Neoplatonism. Oh. He saw himself until the end of his days as an empiricist and a man of science. So, I mean, I'm just saying, I just suggest cautiousness there because. Well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm it's saying. not about putting labels, it's just putting this is the history, this is the ways, this is the ways we can see it. Well, these are things happening, but not exactly, I would uh, go the way cause and effect, but rather some thinking taking place on the various planes. David, just for the conclusion. Well, uh, well <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm thinking about the difference between Jung, maybe, and the Jungians. Mm -hmm. Um, uh -huh. uh, you take me back to my late adolescence when I fell amongst a group of Jungians who were very much interested in the occult. This is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in mm -hmm. association with the Harvard Divinity School. And um, my question, though, if I'm allowed to, is about Crowley and sex, because we didn't talk about Crowley, and because we always talked about sex, we should have. Uh, you said he was pansexual. Did he see... Um, I mean, obviously, sex is usually very selective, and mm -hmm. if you go empirically, but did he see some kind of releasing of repressions in the direction of pansexuals being mm -hmm. some kind of occult discovery? That would have interest, interested us very much. When it comes to Crowley and sexuality, well, he tends to interpret many things as a sexual, sexual being not uh, exactly bodily sexual, but a sexual on a drive towards yes. wholeness, towards linking and uh, towards creation. And I would just uh, not interpret Crowley in the means of a physical sex, but rather sexuality as creativity. Of course, it's all uh, put in many metaphors, but there are some places, for example, like in the Liber Aleph, when Crowley speaks about sexuality rather plainly. All right. 
Well, thank you. Thank you.